Okay. Okay. Ready? Share my screen. Ready to go? So now I will greet people first. Okay. Okay. So good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa. Annyeonghaseyo. And hello, all. Welcome and thank you for joining us, the 44th seminar. And I call it Imperial College London Day. I am back to home after my 10 weeks of seminar trip to give 25 talks. But after my Symbis seminar today, I will resume my trips mostly in United States now, as opposed to the world tour I did for last 70 days. It's good to be back to home and spend some time with my wife in Spain for a week. Okay, uh, it's my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Paul Primont. He is, of course, I mean, we don't need, he doesn't need any introduction because we all know him. Uh, he is a co-director of the UK Innovation and Knowledge Center for Synthetic Biology and Simbi site Imperial College London he has been leading the synthetic biology field and has contributed to you know, UK and European synthetic biology community tremendously. So it's my amazing and tremendous honor to have him today. And Professor Primont, and thank virtual you. podium is all yours. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your very kind introduction. I'll just show a few slides. And um, I wanted to really do a sort of remind everyone about some of the very significant issues we're facing and why I think synthetic biology is a, such an exciting technology and why people who are in it um, have a real huge opportunity to make enormous impacts. So I start off with this slide. I think everyone this year has experienced what this slide indicates. Even in the UK, we have temperatures of 41 degrees, which is really unheard of. Um, we have got a problem. Um, and I think, you know, without putting too, I don't want to, you know, be too gloomy on this because I don't want to depress everyone. But I think we are reaching a time sort of in human history where a sort of series of factors are all coming together at the, at the right time. And, and they're really making the future of humanity in the very, very long term, quite uncertain. And I think this is an important um, issue that we all need to take on board. And I think um, one of the interesting things uh, when we start looking at the global challenges is to try and divide them up. So this is now population versus food. If you look at the population growth that we're expecting over the next period of time, everyone's predicting 9 billion or 10 billion by 2050, certainly 9 billion by 2050. And when you then relate that to food production, um, currently we're already using around 40% of the available land mass of the earth uh, for crop production. So the point I'm trying to make is that on the planet earth, we have a finite fixed set of land that can be used for food production. And of course, there are significant issues when we start interfering in other parts of um, the, the world land, uh, like the rainforest to try and uh, make food. So these are some big sort of issues. If we look at um, climate change, say versus water and energy consumption. So everyone realizes that CO2 um, emissions is, is increasing. And I think it's completely scientifically robust to suggest that that is now responsible for a global heating of the planet. And then when we relate that to things like water, um, you know, currently we're already requiring 40% or predicted to require 40% more than our current supplies of water. And then if we look at energy, which is on the bottom of that graph, so this is, this is how the world fuels itself energetically, if you like. And you'll the only thing you need to notice there is that the green and the gray and the sort of reddish color 
uh, essentially are um, gas, uh, coal, and oil. And that accounts for over 82% of all of the energy produced in the world. So whilst we have an enormous renewable activity ongoing, you can see that we have an absolutely ginormous mountain to climb in order to remove our dependency on gas, coal, and oil for energy production. Uh, that's a sort of water scarcity uh, graph, uh, which I found very interesting. And there are parts of the world where water is becoming incredibly scarce drinking water. Now, if we um, sort of look forward and summarize that, then, you know, there is this argument that 2030, which is just around the corner, there's going to be increases of food, water, and energy required. Um, and this was made by Achim Steiner, uh, part of the United Nations Development Program in 2018. It may not be 2030, it could be 2035, it doesn't matter, but the point is that there are uh, some really big demands on the planet um, to sustain humanity. Then more recently, we had the UN COP meeting in the UK in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, which was November 2021. And I think the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, was getting so upset by what was going on. He made this quite famous quote where he essentially suggested that uh, our addiction to fossil fuels um, is like digging our own graves. Um, you know, we shouldn't be deep in deeper mining. We shouldn't be going, you know, we're enough of treating nature like a toilet, enough of burning and drilling and mining our way deeper. We're digging our own graves. And I think this was a, a, a very poignant speech made at a time which was only last November, so not long ago. So I suppose the question we're all facing is how do we move, you know, to more sustainable processes, generate new types of economies for the world in 2050 and beyond? What technologies can we harness and how do we make these technologies affordable and accessible to all parts of the planet? And this is where I think you have an exciting and an amazing opportunity to contribute to that. Because I com completely strongly advocate and believe in the technology of synthetic biology and engineering biology as one of the major technologies that will allow us to address some of these, not all, but some of these major challenges that we face. And in order for uh, the context of that, I thought it would be worth just going through, you know, what are the drivers? In the real world, we have to deal with the real world. And there are many real reality checks along the way. So just let's go through a few. So let's look at technology. So we all know that you are at a time in your research careers and your educational careers where you have this enormous convergence of disciplines where actually you know, people cross over between molecular biology, computational protein design, engineering design, computational sciences, or, or there's a huge sort of crossover flux of bioengineering of different technologies all converging, which I think is a very exciting period. So this technology convergence is, is truly happening. And in synthetic biology, of course, we have the fundamentals. We know how to move bits of DNA around between cells. We know how to read DNA. And of course, we know how to write DNA, and there's a huge opportunity to bring those technologies together. The other thing which I think we're all aware of is that the, the cost of reading DNA is very cheap. The cost of writing DNA is not so cheap, but it's going to come down. And I think it will come down substantially over the next 10 years. So our reading and ability to read and write DNA is going to become much more uh, easier. Um, and there are new opportunities for powerful tools like machine learning and predictive biology and the DeepMind AlphaFold development really indicated the power of these kinds of deep learning technologies when you have well annotated, very, very well defined data sets. And of course, there's now an opportunity for us to use more of these tools in our synthetic biology um, engineering design cycle to try and work out how best to engineer living systems or make new living systems. So I think this is a very exciting time technologically. Um, but just one thing, we still don't understand the language of DNA. We still can't predictably write DNA and put it in a cell and robustly get a pre predefined predicted outcome. So we still don't fully understand how cells use DNA in terms of a language. And I think this is still a huge, enormous challenge. The synthetic biology design cycle, I think, tries to address this. I think most people in the field understand that. And I think this, this conceptual framework really builds on everything I've just said. And it leads to the, the idea of these automated biofoundries, these integrated workflows, these kind of engineering thinking on how to build 
design construct living systems. Now, whilst this is the London Biofoundry, which I direct, which is, you know, clearly has a significant public investment. I mean, there are many people interested in, you know, low cost automation, accessible technologies, accessible high throughput technologies uh, that allow other people access to this kind of technology. But I strongly believe that biofoundries is going to be a way forward for what I would call the more democratization of the technology. So I was very lucky to be uh, involved in co-founding the Global Biofoundry Alliance, and also I'm currently the chair. And you will see on this global map, there are, there are two major continents that are not represented in the GBA, which we really are working hard to solve. Um, but my vision would be that we have many, many, many more dots all over the world, public funded biofoundries, driving uh, accessibility and democratization of the technology worldwide in order for everyone to benefit. Because as I said earlier, this is a global problem and every part of the world needs to develop solutions to tackle some of these problems. Now, in the real world, a lot of young researchers may not think much about it, but policy is a key driver. And I'm just going to finish now on a few more slides on this, uh, literally three more slides. So one of the things that really is happening in the world, and I think everyone should be aware of it, is governments, uh, policymakers, everyone is completely on board with the need to solve our planetary health problems. It's not so much climate change, it's all about climate repair. How are we going to move forward from here? And so there's an open window and an open door for innovation, for technology. And this also comes from the private sector and other types of sectors. There is a real opportunity here um, to build uh, out this bio-based future that we want to see. So this is an interesting development and I think it will continue to uh, really you know, grow. The other thing is that um, there is this over-dependence on oil, as I showed you, 82% of all our energy in the world comes from gas, coal, or oil. This is not sustainable. We know that this has got to change. It's got to change rapidly. And there are going to be all sorts of government and international um, coordination around how we change. And things like carbon pricing, carbon taxation, all these economic drivers will come into play in order to provide you know, opportunities for innovators like yourselves to, be, to bring new technologies, new companies uh, to tackle these problems. So I think it's very, very exciting in that context. And then finally, there is the economics of synthetic biology in the commercial sense, where there is a growing private investment portfolio and a growing market, mainly in healthcare, but also across other sectors. And I think this is important for those of you who want to become the entrepreneurs of the future. And finally, um, the US sustainable goals are still out there. We have big challenges there. We need to address all of these goals. And I think synthetic biology can provide uh, solutions to many of them. So finally, um, the world is yours, I think, to develop, um, I would call them planet saving technologies that will help all of humanity. And I, I think this is, you know, it's, if you wanted to be at a point in time with a technology um, that's exciting in synthetic biology, this is the time. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're all privileged to be involved at this point in time. So I'm very excited and I hope, I hope you will be as well. Thank you. So amazing. Uh, I mean, this is the really serious problem or opportunity for us. And also thank you for you know your invaluable insight and vision, and I completely agree with you. And now we are facing the climate I would call emergency, and if we do not act immediately, there would be no future for all of us. So we rely on researchers, especially young people, to solve this problem together. So thank you so much for your amazing uh, insight about this problem. Okay, no so problem. yeah. Okay, so now the main speaker of today with a, a longer introduction, Dr. Mana is currently a postdoctoral scholar at the group of Professor Ming Hammon in the University of Utah, USA where she works on RNA engineering to develop genetically encodable tools for synthetic biology and biotechnology applications. 
she pursued her PhD from the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research in India. Her PhD work was focused on the chemical biology of eucleic acid and particularly on the development of eucleoside probes, probes to understand the structure and recognition of eucleic acid in the cell-free and cellular environment. Her research interest in focus on the development of synthetic biology tools to understand the role of eucleic acid in antimicrobial therapeutics. So Dr. Mana, take it away and thanks so much for your time today. Oh, oh. Thank you, Professor Moon, for the introductions. And first of all, thank you very much for arranging this amazing lecture series and giving opportunities to young researchers like us. So uh, my name is Sudeshna Manna. Um, as uh, he mentioned, I'm currently working in University of Utah with um, the lab of Professor Min Hammond. And today's topic, I'll uh, discuss about development of genetically encodable RNA-based biosensor and how we can improve the performance of these biosensors. Now, before going to the uh, main uh, topic, I just want to briefly uh, I'll tell you about my background. So by training, I am a chemist. So um, I did my PhD from India from the group of Professor Srivatsan. So where I worked on the development of responsive nucleoside probe, which, which was helpful to study nucleic acid properties in cell-free and cellular environment. So uh, basically we uh, designed and synthesized a series of micro-environment sensitive nucleoside probe, um, majorly the uridine analogs, and incorporated those probes into oligonucleotide either by solid phase synthesis or by enzymatic synthesis and used those modified oligonucleotides to study the nucleic acid conformation or switch or its structure and recognitions. For example, those probes were used to study DNA and RNA G quadruplexes um, formations of detection of formation of those structures in cellular models or the detection of metallo-based pair in nucleic acids. And also we develop a dual app probe where we attach a fluorine atom in the fluorophore, which, will act, which acts as a both fluorescence active molecule as well as uh, suitable for 19F NMR. And we use that probe to determine the con preferred conformation formed by human telomeric DNA repeat in live cells by in-cell NMR analysis. And also the uh, ribonucleoside version of the probe was used to detect the conformational switch in an IRES element of hepatitis C virus um, in presence of metal ion. So with this training, I joined uh, University of Utah, where, uh, which I'll talk about the development uh, where I'm working on development of RNA-based biosensor for molecular imaging. Now in recent years, or synthetic or the natural occurring RNAs are being used to develop different tools in uh, biotechnology or synthetic biology. For example, uh, developing diagnostics tool um, you know, based on RNA switches or RNA-based sensor for, or, um, for you know, detecting environmental pollutant or RNA-based devices are being um, developed for gene regulations and many more applications. However, the one RNA as tools that uh, our lab majorly works on are interested in development of riboswitch based fluorescent biosensor. Now, riboswitch is a cis regulatory RNA element that majorly presents in bacteria, and it, uh, in presence of um, any metabolites or target ligands, it undergoes conformational uh, changes, and it's also involved in gene regulations, either in transcriptional and translational regulations. So that in the development of riboswitch-based biosensor, along with riboswitch, another RNA element, which is the fluorogenic ribo, uh, fluorogenic um, aptum, RNA aptamers are, uh, are being used. So they are fused in such a way that the ligand binding will induce the conformational changes in the riboswitch, which, which further facilitates the dye binding to the aptamer and will induce the fluorescence turn. Now, Hammond's lab is uh, in the first few labs that developed 
on ribosomes with biosensor for a series of um, target molecules, including signaling molecules, bacterial metabolites, um, et cetera. So um, although in the last few years, different RBA biosensors have been developed for interesting target molecules, one as important aspect which has not much studied which is the, it's a rate of activations of these biosensors, because that is an important aspect for using the sensor for real-time applications. So there, uh, we were interested to uh, study the response time scales, time scale of this RBF uh, biosensor. Because in the previous studies, there was no real-time monitoring of the biosensor activations in cell, because in the prior studies, majority of the cases, RBA biosensors activation depending on any enzyme activity to produce the target molecule for those biosensor in cells. So, and also there is no direct comparison of the inhibitor kinetics of different ribosuit-based sensing tools, for example, ribosuit-based biosensor versus widely used ribosuit-based reporter. Therefore, we uh, were interested to answer these questions how fast can a ribosuit-based biosensor respond in vivo? And how much faster uh, it is um, the ribosuit-based biosensor compared to a ribosuit-based reporter if they are derived from the same ribosuit aptamer and for, a, for sensing a particular target molecule? So to answer the first question, we chose guanidine as a target molecule. So which is a known chaotropic agent an environmental pollutant that uh, recently as after discovering of the guanidine ribosome has established as a bacterial metabolite and in recent report has been indicated as a nitrogen source in bacteria. And most importantly, uh, guanidine is cell permeable and can be transported into the cell from the exogenous media and it is non-toxic to uh, E. coli up to millimolar level. So therefore, if we develop guanidine biosensor, we can do the real-time monitoring of this biosensor in FIBO activations. Then uh, next we develop guanidine biosensor uh, using um, class one guanidine ribosuit and fluorogenic RNA aptamer spinach too. And the design was done by um, former graduate student in our group, Dr. Johnny Thrund. He uh, also tried several design strategies, but the junction design strategy worked pretty well. One of the major challenges in this design was that the five prime and three prime end of the ribosomes are quite distant. So we used the artificial transducer stem, PGO, to attach this, um, the spinach to aptamer to the ribosomes. And this design strategy worked pretty well. And here you can, and, and they were able to detect guanidine in vitro very selectively against other. Uh, structural and functional analog of guanidine. And here I showed the data with the three uh, guanidine biosensors. So, and uh, the KPN and DRU uh, are the, uh, we use the ribosomes from different bacterial phylogeny. So, well, then the biosensor were working in vitro. Then we went forward and wanted to check whether the biosensor will work in vivo or not. For that, we cloned the biosensor in a tRNA scaffold for its homogeneous and expression and better stability, and then transform the cell with the biosensor, a plasmid containing the biosensor construct, then express the biosensor in, uh, in E. coli, and then treated the cell with a dye um, uh, and waited for 10 minutes the, uh, to allow the dye to enter into the cells, and then treated the cells with uh, um, ligand guanidine and uh, waited for 15 minutes and then measured the cellular fluorescence by flow cytometry. And um, here is the uh, data. So uh, you can see that uh, all three biosensors were functional uh, in vitro. people. Um, okay. Then our, uh, we are also interested to know whether um, once we express this biosensor, uh, how long they are stable and how long they will be functional. For that, we stored the um, cells expressing the biosensor in a non-inducing media in cold temperature, and then measured its functionality over uh, several days. And uh, we were um, excited to see that the um, biosensor were stable up to 11 days after its expression and were functional. So that were pretty cool. Then uh, as our major goal was to measure the in vivo kinetics of these biosensors in cells, 
we did a close cytometry based um, uh, kinetic assay where we measured the cellular fluorescence after uh, adding the guanidine over a period of one hour. And um, we measured the mean fluorescence intensity by flow cytometry. And when we plotted the uh, delta um, MFI by, uh, versus MFI, uh, you can clearly see that there is a gradual increase of uh, cellular fluorescence over um, uh, um, with time. And uh, um, if we zoom in uh, the graph, we can see that all three biosensors are so that's detectable signal as quick as like four minutes after guanidine additions and their maximum uh, response were um, in, in the range of time 10 to um, uh, 30 minutes. Okay, then uh, um, we also wanted to compare the in vivo turn on kinetics of this biosensor with a uh, riboswitch based reporter where we used same uh, riboswitch aptamer that we used for the um, constructing the biosensor. And the reporter was um, constructed where we placed the guanidine riboswitch upstream of the lag zine, and then the, um, we quantified the protein expressions, um, like reporter uh, gene expression by Miller assay. And we did a uh, kinetic assay for the reporter for, um, for, uh, in the presence of a um, millimolar guanidine concentration over a several hours. And um, you can um, see that the the reporter requires uh, uh, at least an hour to provide the detectable signal on the, uh, in contrast to the biosensor that makes few, uh, like few minutes to show the detectable um, response. And also one um, point to, uh, I want to mention here that the reporter was less sensitive, so it's, uh, it showed response uh, in millimolar guanidine concentration, whether the biosensor uh, <clears throat> can detect micromolar <coughs> Guanidine concentration. <clears throat> uh, and if we quantify, um, um, it was like 15 times faster biosensor where than the uh, guanidine, even at 100 times uh, uh, lower guanidine concentration. Um, yeah. And uh, our study were um, covered in the ACS synthetic biology um, in 2021. Um, okay, then um, our uh, next question was. Can we make this biosensor response uh, even faster? Or how can we uh, improve its, um, its uh, response kinetics so that this, that's the common strategy can be used to, um, um, you know, can be applied to any other RNA-based sensors? Now, before, uh, so before, uh, so first of all, in this process, we have to know which step is the rate limiting step in the sensing process or which step is the slowest step. Is the step uh, ligand binding to the riboswitch or the dye binding uh, to the to the fluorogenic aptamer? So um, in the previous report and also our study, so that when we did the kinetic study only with the spinach to aptamer, um, in addition after addition of the DFHBI dye, we say that the um, the response is very fast and the T-hap is less than a second. So uh, therefore, this step like dye binding to the Fluorogenic aptamer should not hamper uh, like the overall uh, response kinetics of the biosensor, and also uh, which um, this was also um, uh, approved by a kinetic study of the guanidine biosensor in two different conditions. In the first conditions, we uh, measured the kinetics uh, where we pre-equilibrated the biosensors with guanidine and then added um, the dye. And in the second conditions, we pre-equilibrated the biosensors with DFHBI dye, then added um, the um, uh, ligand guanidine. And um, you can find the, in the first case, the biosensors response were uh, way faster than in the second condition. So all these studies indicates that the uh, guanidine-induced riboswitch folding uh, is the slowest, uh, slowest step. Now, um, next question is how we can break the speed limit of the riboswitch folding. Now, uh, riboswitch is in ligand unbound state is very dynamic in nature. So we, we thought that along with the binding competent uh, if, uh, state which, which are capable to bind the ligand, there might be some misfolded state or binding incompetent state. So which is limiting the um, the actual speed of the biosensor. So how we can close this uh, non-binding pathway or break the speed limit of the riposuits folding? 
Now, one advantage in case of RNA that it interacts in base pairing manner. So if we can figure it out which base pairs are involved in misfolding, and if we can mutate those base pairs and disrupt those misfolding, we can lock the RNA in the right conformation, which uh, eventually can help to enhance the speed of these biosensors. So for that, uh, we did a systematic base pair mutagenesis study, where we did the um, base pair mutations at guanidine riboswitch aptamer, and uh, we did mutation at those nucleotide positions which are not conserved and not directly involved in ligand binding. And we did two type of mutations. One is transpose mutation, another one purine pyrimidine swapping mutation. In the transpose mutations, we flip the bases. For example, AU was flipped with UA. And in the purine pyrimidine swapping mutations, we change the um, pyrimidine pyrimidine bases, like AU was, for example, AU was replaced with GC. And then we did the initial kinetic screening. What are the effect of this um, mutation on the biosensor kinetics? With uh, with the uh, with screen like thirty four mutations, and um, and you can see that green boxes which indicates the faster um, mutants than the wild type one, and we are able to get um, a good number of faster mutants, kinetic mutants than the wild type biosensor. However, this as uh, initial screening was done um, with the crude transcript. Then we uh, purified the um, RNA by page and then confirmed this initial screening data. And with that screening, we, we observed that the, these two positions, like U3 and U4 positions, both the transpose and puridine pyrimidine swapping mutations maintains the full turn on. And some, in some cases, they are even showed higher full turn on than the wild type one and all the mutations made the biosensor faster than wild type one and higher rate constant. And here I showed the, represented the graph with the fastest one, which is like nearly a minute faster kinetics than the wild type one by doing only a single base pair mutations that is like UA or it was with the uh, CG. Okay, then um, we uh, um, again wanted to say, can we make it even faster or what will be the effect of if we incorporate some unnatural base pairs into those kinetic hotspots? So uh, our hypothesis is that if as X and Y are orthogonal, so uh, base pairs, so, um, and they, so X will only base pair with Y and uh, they will not base pair with any other natural nucleo basis, so uh, their base pairing can lock the RNA in the right conformations and can, um, can enhance the um, biosensor kinetics. Now, um, in the last several years, those th uh, three major groups, like Professor Boehner groups, Ramesh Bar group, and Hirao group, they are, um, they are focused on developing unnatural um, 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 nu nucleic acid base pair which can act as a third or um, fourth base pair in the nucleic acid. So the major two classes of base, unnatural base pairs is the hydrogen bonding unnatural base pair and non-hydrogen bonding unnatural base pairs. So we were particularly interested in non-hydrogen bonding base pairs. And we, uh, for that, we are, we, are, um, we are collaborating with Professor Ichiro Hirao, where we wanted to uh, incorporate a uh, PA uh, DS base pair in those kinetic hotspot. So they, uh, this base pair are they are, are based on the site complementarity and the hyperphilic interactions. And this particular base pair worked um, pretty well or good fidelity in transcription reactions. So then uh, we um, received the templates from uh, Hirao group of containing the DS PA pair and we did by input to transcriptions, we prepared the uh, biosensor containing PADS at those particular positions. And uh, then the next challenge was to confirm that uh, uh, is the incorporation um, of the unnatural pair in the RNA the right percentage or not, or, or in the right locations. So for that, we digested the RNA into nucleoside level and uh, we did the LC by LCMS analysis. Uh, we confirmed the um, percentage of incorporations and which matches pretty well with the expected one. And then to confirm the locations of the incorporations, 
we did a partial digestion uh, by using RNAs T1. So if the incorporation is the right positions, then we can uh, get these two particular fragment um, uh, containing PA or DAs and then confirm the presence of this fragment in the di digested RNA by high resolution mass analysis. So, um, also, so that confirm the positions of incorporation of this um, natural uh, basis in the uh, RNA biosensors. And also the um, Dr. Michiko Kimoto from Hirao group also confirmed the in, uh, positions of incorporation by reverse transcription reactions, where she reverse transcribed the uh, biosensors um, and uh, using the DSPX and other uh, unnatural base pairs and thus um, and confirm the positions by page analysis. I'll just briefly tell uh, the increase of the intensity of the um, 130 mark of band in presence of uh, the PXTP confirm the positions of the uh, uh, DS um, in the um, in the biosensor and also the um, increasing the intensity of, of the band and the um, full length product in presence of um, the um, uh, DSTP and PXTP uh, confirm the presence of um, the, the positions of PA in the um, transcript of the, in the biosensor and also the position of the um, PX um, in the uh, cDNA was confirmed by partial digestion of the cDNA phase analysis. So uh, overall, these are all, the, all three um, experiments proved that the uh, um, incorporation was in the right positions and the right percentages. And then uh, we went forward and we wanted to check whether these um, PADS incorporations of the unnatural based incorporation will hamper the biosensor functionality or not. And here we can uh, see that um, the, uh, all the, um, in the two positions, PA, PADS incorporations, they didn't hamper the biosensor full uh, turn on, so it maintains its functionality. And then we measured the, its uh, kinetics. And um, here you can see in, in, both, in the, both the positions, incorporation of the UVP uh, uh, made the biosensor faster. Um, it's, um, it's, and however, we got the similar result like the natural mutations, which is like a single uh, unnatural based pair mutation made biosensor like unit faster and 1.5 times um, higher K rate constant than the wild type one by doing only single unnatural based incorporation. So, yeah, so then to summarize this uh, study, uh, if you compare the natural mutation versus the unnatural based mutation, both are giving the similar result, but we believe that. If we can screen uh, in different other places of this unnatural based incorporation, we might get in uh, even faster kinetics um, than the natural mutations. So um, overall, I want to uh, conclude here this study that single base pair mutations, either by flipping the bases or incorporating uh, new pyrimidine purine base pairs in site specific manner, or incorporating in the unnatural base pair we actually can uh, close the non-binding pathway and can enhance this ribosuit folding or the ribosuit with biosensor rates. And um, so with that, I want to summarize my talk. So we developed ribosuit based uh, biosensor for uh, target molecule guanidine and compared the in vivo kinetics of the ribosuit based biosensor and a reporter. And we showed that biosensors are um, responsive pretty faster than the reporter and can be used in the real time analysis. And uh, in the second part, I showed how uh, systematic base pair mutagenesis can make a um, ribosuit based devices faster. And we believe that this strategy also can be um, used in other ribosuit based devices. So, yeah, with that, I want to just mention that uh, I'm, um, I'm going to move uh, next um, to my next postdoc. So due to some visa issues, I'm uh, leaving US and uh, joining Professor uh, Chase Basil Groups uh, in Helmholtz uh, Institute of RNA Testing Quick Service at my next move, where I'll be working on development of um, CRISPR-based uh, te uh, diagnostic technology and also simultaneously I'm looking for a faculty positions in India. And the research interest I have in my independent research career in future, the exploring RNA as novel drug targets, um, which will include the development of high throughput screening tool where you can study the RNA drug interactions or you can see the 
um, uh, what is the regulatory functions of RN, of the those ligand on RNA. And also I'm interested in designing new chemical scaffold or RNA ligands, which can act potentially as a uh, you know, drug molecules. And in the another directions I'm interested to explore is designing genonucleic acid-based therapeutic agents, particularly genonucleic acid-based DNA giant for efficient gene silencing, which will include the uh, sugar, modif uh, sugar modifications of the nucleic acid as well as base modifications. Uh, with that, I want to thank uh, both my uh, PhD and postdoc group and my uh, both mentors for their mentorship and uh, all the funding agencies and all the collaborators. And thank you all for your kind attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. So, so it's amazing talk. And then also uh, the Chase Baser is pretty good, you know, colleague of mine. Uh, you know, you can learn a lot from him. So let me check uh, any question from audience. Uh, I do not see. Uh, let's see. The poll, are you still there? Okay. Yeah. Do you yeah. have any comment or question before I ask? Yeah, one no, I, I thought it was a really, a really lovely talk. Well, you know, really nice, nice presentation. Um, you know, if you then, push forward a few years, you're learning a lot about, you know, using RNA as a tool for many different applications. So when you go back to India, where do you think the most impact could be made with the technologies that you have been developing in terms of your research career so far? Yeah, one uh, direction I'm interested in is like uh, the, um, exploring RNA as um, uh, like novel antibiotic target. So uh, if I see that antibiotic development, like the tools available, like it's not, it's not sufficient tools are there to screen uh, like different ligands uh, versus uh, different RNA and how they are affecting the regulatory functions of their RNA simultaneously. Uh, yeah, those things I wanted to concentrate on. And also as in, I have also experience in synthetic chemists. So I, I would like to design new RNA targeting drugs, like new chemical scaffold, and majorly the antibiotic resistance is a major problem in India, like one, one of the country which is facing the really problem. So I want to work on that, on, yeah, and nucleic acid-based therapeutics, basically. Great. Sounds good. Okay, so let me ask one challenging question, as usual. So, this is amazing talk. Uh, and then, you know, as you know, with alpha four, protein structure prediction would be more accurate than ever. However, RNA 3D structure prediction, considering all the dynamic structural change and ensemble, is still very, very challenging, although the technology developed for structural characterization by sequencing and so on. And so could you kind of comment on this point because that will be very important for your, you know, research career later on. More, more likely, you know, focusing on the challenges and opportunities. So, uh, yeah. So I, I would say I would take it as an opportunity because RNA, as it can form different structures or it's very dynamic, we can utilize them to in the different directions, and. Um, as I said, that chemical modifications and also can be play a major role in like how we can modify its dynamics or or it's more I would say like more uh, we can reduce some challenges. Uh, I I would take it an advantage, but definitely using RNA developing de devices tool is more challenging where you have to predict its secondary structures or how it interacts with the it's um, other molecules, biomolecules. Right, so the, actually my question is more likely secondary structure we easily predict right now, but 3D structure uh, is not easily done. Also, there are many pseudo interaction and then, and then the RNA molecule, you know, you know, in terms of 3D you know, structure is very important for the function. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I would say that definitely it's challenge to that these dynamic RNAs to crystallize sometimes. So mostly people use the like ligand bound state and this riboswitch is 
if, if for example, it's really apple state is not present, like majority of the structure in the bound state. So yeah, that is the major challenge. I, I would say the modeling studies and also the NMR studies in that case will be helpful, but definitely is real challenge also the solving the NMR structure of this um, RNA. Right, right, right. That, that's interesting you know, answer. So thank you. Uh, you know, Paul, do you have any additional one? In the presentation, you talked about the non-natural base incorporation improving the dynamics of the system. And I may have missed this, but does one understand the mechanism of that? Is it some kind of stabilization of some tertiary structure that is more, provides an increased binding affinity or what is, what is the mechanism? Yeah, so that's interesting question. So we are interested in future to crystallize this uh, unnatural uh, basis of the uh, this biosensor definitely to understand what is happening. So mm -hmm. our basic uh, thought is now that uh, like, it's actually in the in the polar media, those unnatural base pairs, like they are coming close and forcing to form it right conformation. So it's just making the faster. So right. yeah, we are we don't know about the stability because we didn't check actually um, the stability yet, but it's known that uh, these unnatural pair, their TM like thermal melting is equal to the natural basis. So they are pretty stable like natural base pairs. Yeah, so sure. that's a very interesting area to explore and to expand on that the use of non-natural base pairing to stabilize or to alter different conformational states of the of the um of the switch yeah it could be interesting yeah, it's really but good. hard to incorporate at the top but i don't know maybe you can do it using cell free or something mm -hmm. so absolutely so let me check one more time okay i guess uh there's no further question uh, okay, so let me close. So thank all for joining and staying today, especially during the vacation weeks. We'll meet again next week on August 4, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Dr. Ernesto, uh, it's very difficult to uh, pronounce her, his last name, Andrianato Andro, an editor of Cell Systems, and Dr. Siva Somu at University of Delaware. We'll have another Simbi seminar next Friday due to the scheduling. As usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speaker. So thank you so much. I, I will stop recording right now. Just give me one second. Uh, stop recording.